Our scripture text is found in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and there will be two pieces, the first verse and then verses 5 through 15. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on, the, on a mountainside and he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Now, beginning with the fifth verse. No, no, no. Six, five. There we go. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. And I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is, in, who is unseen, and then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. They, this, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. The nation of China is in a dilemma. Curious dilemma. Ian Johnson is the author of a book entitled The Souls in China. Now, China actually has, as best we can count, more Christians in China than in America. At one point, Ian Johnson in his book set, writes this, a double-edged sword for the Chinese government. On the one hand, government leaders think that religion can provide some stability in a society, the Chinese society, that is racing forward and doesn't have a center of gravity. But religion creates values that are above government values. Ideas like justice and righteousness and truth and these things can come back to haunt the Communist Party. So they are conflicted about what they should do about Christianity in China. On the one hand, it will give stability to the nation. On the other, it will challenge the values and the intentions of the government. Hmm. Well, the unsettling thing about Ian Johnson is that he could be talking about America. We threw out the Judeo-Christian basis for community life about 50 years ago. And with it, we threw out the stability as a people so that we are also racing forward without a center of gravity as a nation creating a land of alternative facts, mental and physical violence, amoral social relationships, and on it goes. And very few citizens really want God meddling with us and telling us how to live our lives. Problem is, it's a package deal for both the Chinese and the Americans because we cannot have the fruits of godly living 
while rejecting the power and directions of God's presence in our lives, which makes it possible for us to harvest the fruit of godly living. And adding to the problem, many of our population have placed their lives in a permanent fast-forward mode. It comes from technology. Smartphones, iPads, stereo buds keep our minds so focused on unending stimulation that we become modern Epicureans. That is, we, we have no time to read a book. We have no time to wonder about life. We have no time to examine fat values or ponder God and self as we move from one sound bite to another sound bite, getting terribly anxious if we have two minutes of downtime and we haven't got something filling it in our earbuds or checking our iPhones to see who might be sending something or the next game we've got to finish. I think it's so sad. I, I walk every morning, early in the morning, and even though I live in the middle of the city, I see deer, I see fox, I see raccoons, I hear the owls, the turkeys, all this going on about five in the morning. And I see other people and they've got the earbuds in and they're watching their iPhones and they have no clue. They don't even see that they're coming to a curb. And I think, how can we, how can we find God in his world? if we can't stand to be open to silence and quiet for a few moments. In this mode, living in the grace and glory of the Lord God, we forget about that, and we become servants to a broken world in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Trying to have Christian values to guide us without the empowering of the indwelling Christ is like trying to buy, drive a brand new car that doesn't have an engine in it. The indwelling Christ is our engine. Paul helps us to understand part of what it takes to be a Christian in his letter to, the Philippi, to, uh, to Philippi. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is right and pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if there is any excellence in anything, if there is anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. But that's hard to do when we're mesmerized by our smartphones and being hammered by the beats that are coming in in our earbuds. A few years ago, Philosopher Glenn Tinder wrote a widely discussed article for the Atlantic Monthly, Can We Be Good Without God? Well, he goes through quite a lot of material. But the final word is no. No, we cannot be good without God, because human beings inevitably drift toward hedonism and selfishness unless something is outside of ourselves, something transcendent, in this case, agape love, and it causes us to care about someone other than ourselves. That's, that's the struggle in China. The struggle China's dealing with today. This is the same struggle that is overwhelming our society today. Ironically, that article appeared one month after the fall of the Iron Curtain. One month after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and with it fell the Marxian dream that had enveloped nearly half the population of the earth. The perfect, they believed that the perfect society, the just society, could be created through human initiative and design alone based on atheism. 
And just about the time that Tinder wrote and published this article that we can't be good without God, the fall of the Iron Curtain proved exactly that point. Atheism cannot produce the good society. Now, we're going to set that here for a moment, and we're going to move over here for a second component. We'll see if we can tie it together. It is essential that we recognize that the Sermon on the Mount was given to a private gathering. The Sermon on the Mount is chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew. And the Sermon on the Mount is generally considered to be a naive, totally out of touch with reality set of teachings that are useless in this real dog-eat-dog -dog world in which we live. And so here again, that one verse, chapter 5, verse 1, introducing the Sermon on the Mount. Now when he saw the crowds... He went up on the mountainside and he sat down and his disciples came up the hill to him and he began to teach them. The crowds were down at Capernaum, down by the lake. He left the lake, walked up the hill. It's a pretty good walk, been there. It's up on the, what they call it, the Mount of Beatitudes. And his disciples came up to him. The crowds did not follow Jesus up the hillside. Only his disciples climbed that hill to hear this master of theirs. Those who had left their old jobs, those who had committed as much of themselves as they knew to as much of this, to this Messiah as they could understand. And the Sermon on the Mount just plain was not for the masses. It's a way of life. It's a system of guidelines for living successfully that is diametrically opposed to all legal systems. The Chinese government is right on in their concerns. The Christian faith could overwhelm the communist government. It's a way of life, you see. Maybe it's okay to have the Ten Commandments on the courthouse lawn. It's a statement about the sovereignty of God, and then it's followed by a system of external guides for moral living. It is not okay to have the Sermon on the Mount on the courthouse lawn. Because these new teachings are not for the general population. It's a body of spiritual commands which cannot be accepted and practiced unless a commitment to God through Jesus Christ has already been made. Non-believers will read these teachings and they'll think that they make for a nice little fairy tale but they're wholly impractical and unworkable in a world like ours. The Lord's Prayer is part of this exclusive Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Theologian William Bark, they called it the Disciples' Prayer. He said that the Lord never prayed it, and he was teaching the disciples. He wasn't teaching everybody, he was teaching the disciples. This prayer, like the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, was given only to his committed followers. It's not meant to be prayed at a public event of non-believers. Non-believers don't believe what they're saying. They certainly don't pledge to uphold or abide by what is being stated in that prayer because they haven't committed to Christ. In the same way, the Sermon on the Mount includes a variety of moral teachings which are impossible to keep without a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, which empowers us to live our changed lives. But let's focus on that disciples or the Lord's Prayer. And just on one line, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just that piece. 
a quick look at the order of the prayer, the first three petitions have to do with God and God's glory in the prayer. And the second three petitions have to do with our needs and our necessities. And that is the proper order of things. God is first, and his place is supreme. And then, and only then, we turn to ourselves and our needs and our desires. So we make sure that we understand where God is and where we are and what we need. Prayer is not bent, not meant to attempt to bend God's will to our desires. Prayer is meant to submit our wills to the will of God, never more remarkably illustrated than that struggle of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, getting our will under God's will. The kingdom of God and the will of God are next, and they're connected. The kingdom, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, who honestly prays such a thing? How many? We really, is that what we really want? Some will pray the Republican part, the will of the Republican Party be done, or the will of the Democratic Party be done, or my will be done. Ah, yes. But not the whole population wants the will of heaven done on earth. But if I'm going to pray, thy will be done, there's some prerequisites. For one thing, I have to believe that God really cares about us. I have to believe that God really cares about me, about you. After all, if I were God, I likely would have written off the human species a long time ago. A good intention gone irrevocably bad. What's to salvage after all of our human carnage? Greed, hatred, self-destruction, all of our road rage, domestic violence and lying. I have to be committed to the belief that the Lord knows and cares about all of the jams that I'm in and all of the jams that you are in. That he cares about that. And I have to believe that the disillusionment and the discouragement with which I'm struggling, with which you are struggling, is important to him. I have to believe that that affects God. And next, even if we believe that God cares, we must accept that God's way is the best way, even better than our way. And his plans for a situation is even better than my plans for that situation. And the Lord knows that I've tried to persuade him a number of times about the how good my way would be. And that may mean that God is not going to heal my brokenness or my disability or the damage done by, to my loved ones. It may mean that God is not going to save my job. Later on, Jesus tells us to ask and we will receive. That's true enough. But there's a catch. Jesus says, for whatever you ask, ask in my name and you shall receive. Did you catch the catch? Ask in my name. Ask as I would ask it. Ask as I would desire it. And finally, we must fully believe that Jesus wants to the best for, for us and for those for whom we are praying, even if that best is different than what we're asking for. And that may mean that we'd better not think 
This is a no-brainer. Of course, it'll be God's will to grant my desire. But God sees a more important issue than we see. I have a friend named David. A little over a year ago, year and a half ago, this is the fifth, this is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther defacing the church doors by tacking that sign up there. The beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And David had all this plan. He was going to lead a group. He, he's a retired professor. He's going to lead this group over to Germany, and we're going to be there for this great celebration. And he had all the studies, and it was going to be an absolutely fabulous tour. He was so excited about it. He'd been praying about it. Six people signed up. Two of them dropped out. Tour was off. He was heartbroken. He had really worked. He'd prayed about it. Well, he was going to then put together this, this group to go to the Balkans because he'd been studying and, and looking at how the Orthodox Church and the Islamic faith community had been struggling to help each other and fighting against each other and so forth. And the Balkans have been in, the his, in our history for the last 10, 15 years quite a bit since Yugoslavia fell apart. Two people were interested with him. That, that fell apart. Again, he was just plain heartbroken. Then this last winter, they found cancer in David. And right now he's undergoing radiation and chemo and he's in pretty bad straits for the moment. He's, I believe he's going to live, but he's, he's just tough. See, he was praying for this thing to happen. God knew he was already sick, and he didn't know he was sick. God knew he had to be cared for, and David didn't even know he needed care. But God knew. And here he is, and now God is taking care of him through the, through the medical procedures. But he couldn't have gone on that trip a year and a half later if he wanted to. Sometimes we pray and we pray. This is what's got to happen. This is going to be the best thing. Many people will be blessed and God doesn't help us out. But oftentimes God knows what we don't know and God's going to be there for us. But in a different way than we would have ever imagined. So when we pray to God, we pray that God's will shall be done in our lives. And he'll accomplish his will in whatever form that takes. And sometimes it's a great celebration and sometimes it's a quiet compassion. It's this kind of commitment which is necessary to understand that we must not hate our enemy, but that we must pray for him. That we must not only not have sexual relations outside of godly commitment to one another, but that we cannot even spend our time as a predator dreaming about what we'd like to do with our sexual prey. That it's not enough to mur not murder someone but that we cannot even humiliate her or belittle him or mock them, murdering their spirit and their humanity by saving, but saving their bodies. That if we're forced to carry a Roman soldier's military pack for one mile, that's what we will give him. And then we will give him the second mile of carrying that pack as our gift to him. We are no longer a victim. We have taken charge of the situation. Giving a gift to our enemy. For unless we have a conversion of our spirits to seek to accomplish God's will first, a nation's laws will never keep us moral or committed to the ideals that will make our nation honorable and sustainable and safe for its citizens.
The conversion of our inner selves is essential to bringing Christian values into a community or a nation. And again, sometimes our enemies can see it better than we can see it ourselves. In October 1991, Philip Yancey, some, many of you will know that name, Philip Yancey. He's written a number of books. He used to be a Christian news reporter. Well, this comes out of his book, What's So Amazing About Grace? In 1991, October, Yancey and a small delegation of Christians, men, women of influence, were invited to the crumbling Soviet empire. Mikhail Gorbachev was barely hanging on as the leader, and Boris Yeltsin was accumulating more, more power by the day. The Christian delegation came to Moscow in response to a plea from Russian leaders for help in restoring morality to their country. Russian leaders were asking these American Christians to come and help them restore morality in their nation. The Christians were received. They had a friendly welcome amongst all the political leaders. Now, they headed for the KGB headquarters. I've stood outside of that KGB headquarters. That is a fearsome place. They were headed for the KGB headquarters and the old timers and their delegation warned that their reception by the KGB would be very different than the political leaders. The Christians were ushered into a room to be greeted by General Nikolai Stolyarov, vice chairman of the KGB. And as the delegation braced itself, General Stolyarov said, Meeting with you here tonight is a plot twist that could not have been conceived by the wildest fiction writer. Well, he got that right. We're here, said Stolyarov, we're here in the USSR. We realize that we too often have been negligent in accepting those of the Christian faith. But political questions cannot be decided until there is a sincere repentance and return to faith by the people. That is the cross I must bear, said General Stolyarov. In the study of scientific atheism, there was the idea that religion divides people. Now we see the opposite, love for God can only unite. This in the KGB headquarters. After a question about the gulags and all the people suffering in the gulags at the hands of the KGB, Stolyarov responded, I have spoken of repentance. This is an essential step. There can be no perestroika apart from repentance. The time has come to repent of the past. We have broken the Ten Commandments and for this we pay a dear price today. Are we Americans listening to this? Now I was in the USSR in 1988 just as perestroika was getting legs, getting underway. And I couldn't believe a sense, sensing the bewilderment of the people and the enormous changes that were on the horizon when nobody yet knew just three years away. But consider what's happening. In the 1990s and now in the 21st century, two huge atheistic nations on the planet came to the same conclusion. Both in Russia, then in China, over about 20 years apart. 
realize that they must have the values of the Christian faith if they are to save their nations. That which is true and honorable and pure and just and merciful. They didn't just, they just didn't want the Christian structures and the requirements of Christ, Christian commitment to Christ Jesus that goes with it. And so the Russians failed. They saw the problem, they saw the solution, but they didn't like the means, commitment to Jesus Christ. America sorely needs to take these discoveries to heart. The huge caution, however, is for all three nations. It cannot come through a political party or passing laws in the land. It can only come by making a personal commitment to Jesus Christ to live as followers of Christ claiming to be, through Christ, children of the great high God. Doing the ethical thing, whether there's a law about it or not. As followers of Christ, we do the right thing, whether anybody's passed a law about it or not. We do the right thing because we are children of God. Doing the compassionate thing, whether there's legislation to support us or not, we do the compassionate thing because we are children of God through Jesus Christ. Telling the truth, whether our listener has fact check or not. Living a trustworthy life of integrity because it's the Christ-like thing to do, period. Period because that's what Jesus calls us to do. Our primary job in life is to honor and obey the God who owns this planet and commanded us to take care of it and not abuse it and to honor all the forms of life on it and to believe in and to embrace his son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, as Lord. Oh God, such a great task. And yet, we are your people in the basin, in the state, in the nation, to be examples of how to live in this world, that we will be prepared to live in life eternal. Amen.